Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. I don't know about you, but uh, we're coming down to the end of our different preaching this year, our theme. But I hope that sometime in this year of growth, you can actually look back and say something has changed in my life. Hopefully you can look back and say, I'm not the same. There is something different taking hold of my life. That's been the goal this year. I hope that's the goal in your life in a special way. For those of you who knew, we had a pretty rough, as a family, a couple of weeks. My... uh, Father-in-law fell ill with some heart issues. Some of you knew about that. We received a lot of text messages and telling us you're praying and wishing blessings and emails. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of our family. I've got my sister-in-law here too. Uh, For all the prayers that you've given, he is doing okay. He is here with us. He's actually at my sister-in-law's house today, hopefully taking a break and and recuperating. Uh, But um, we're we're grateful for God and his sparing of life. And and that is is something we're grateful for. And, uh, you know, they say sometimes when it rains, it pours. And uh, so it's been a lot because we came home to no heater. And so Brother Alexis basically moved into my house, and for a week, we wrestled with this baby. It tested our faith and Christianity, everything. So, um, but uh, praise God, I think we fixed it, and he fixed it. I was just his assistant. All right, uh, I, I fortunately did not study HVAC in school, but I got a bit of a crash course by the time we were done. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm grateful for Brother Alexis and, and that help that you gave us this week as well uh, in a very special way. But I'm grateful to God. God is good, amen? He's good in the good times and in the bad times. He's good in the challenging times and he's good in the times where everything is going great. I give him praise because he's good. He knows what we need before we even ask him. And he provides as we learn to trust in him more. So let's pray together as we open up God's word and seek his face. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this morning that you have given us. Thank you for being so good, so kind, and so benevolent towards us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for being patient with us and giving us the chance to learn more of you, grow more in you, and to learn to truly trust you. God, we want to be different. You know how easy it is to get stuck in a pattern. You know how it is to find ourselves in the same old, same old. God, we're asking you to break those patterns that are unhealthful in our lives. And to put in us your character, your habits, and your ways. Bless us now as we open up your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit's presence, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Forgive me, I always have to adjust this thing around my ears because other people with bigger ears wear these things. And so it happens. Got all these tall people in my church, so when they're tall, everything else is big or tall. And so just kind of how it works. <laughs> so, but I want to start off this uh, morning and I want to invite you to open up your Bibles. We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 3. But I want to actually start in 1 Peter for a moment. And I would like you to open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. And... Listen to the word of the Lord through the Apostle Peter, 
who, as you already know, was at the end of his ministry and on top of his concern for the church's survival after his death, he was also heavily concerned about how prepared God's people would be for the end of all things. And this is what he writes in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The Bible says, But the end of all things is at hand. Read that with me, nice and loud. But the end of all things is at hand. It's close, right? It's around the corner. It's imminent. It's something to expect, to prepare for, to base your life on. In fact, what you read Peter say afterwards is that therefore be serious and watchful In your prayers. Some Bibles, even uh, translations will say, be sober, be serious, be watchful in prayer before God, knowing that soon everything we know will be gone. At least the way we know it. In fact, Alongside of the preaching of the gospel, or you might say it is part of the preaching of the gospel, is the reality of judgment. It's the reality of a final end to this world of sin and all the pain and trouble that it has caused this planet. In fact, if you read a few verses earlier in chapter 4 as a reminder... We went through some of these together. Verse 3, look what Peter tells his listeners and readers of this letter. He says, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead for this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to God in the spirit part of the reason we preach the gospel is because there will come a time where sin will be no more and everything that sin has caused will be destroyed. And as you learned with me the last time I was with you, a very much part of our understanding of present truth is the reality that judgment is already here. Revelation chapter 14, verses 7 and onward, make very clear that we, the people of God especially, are living in judgment hour. What we await is the final execution of judgment. And that time is coming very soon. It's one of the reasons why the good news has and is being preached until Jesus returns. Giving every person the opportunity to make a decision to join the kingdom of God. Which will one day overcome this kingdom of sin. This kingdom of evil that we live in today. Judgment was a very real concern for Peter. Understanding that at the second coming of Jesus, we will come face to face with the reality of our decisions. What have you truly decided to do with your life? Because if your life has been wrapped around the things of this world, 
then the promise of the Bible is that the things of this world will be destroyed. And everything that stays attached to it, along with it. That's why Jesus said, what is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What have you gained? In fact, that's why I want to bring you to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. And knowing that the end is near, is imminent. Look what Peter further says to his readers. Chapter 3, verse 1 of 2 Peter. Beloved I now write to you this second epistle in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now, now remember, we've already talked about the importance of this statement. To be mindful of these things is to be aware of what the Bible actually teaches now understand that part of the concern that Peter and even the Apostle Paul had in review is that many would rise up within the church and would begin to preach and teach strange doctrine strange things because they're no longer satisfied with the simple gospel truth it's not good enough. And you, you got to be careful when the sincerity of the simplicity of the gospel is no longer good enough for you. And in that desire to seek revival, renewal of heart, you're looking for something new to spark in you the revival that God already wants to give you through the word he already gave you right here. The message of the gospel. If you read chapter 2 of Second Peter. There were many rising up. And Peter has some pretty strong things to say. He calls them beasts. Brutes. Foolish men. Turning people away. From that blessed present truth and seeking to invite them into a world of destruction. That's why knowing the Bible, knowing the prophets, the Hebrew scriptures, knowing the teachings of the apostles which we have in the Greek scriptures and the teachings of Jesus as we have in the gospels of the Greek scriptures is important. Remember something, y'all. There are 66 books in the Bible. You need to know them all. Hear what I'm saying. This is a complete picture. Not just this. This is a complete picture. Not just the last book of the Bible. We need it all. How can we say we are ready for the end of all things. If we're not staying mindful of what we have been taught to begin with. Notice what verse 3 says of 2 Peter 3. Knowing this first. That scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust. Their own passion. Scoffers. People who laugh at people of faith. People who cast shade on people of faith. And the message of faith. People who don't take serious what is in this book. The Bible says. In the last days scoffers will rise up. Walking according to their own desires. Their own passions. And saying. Where is the promise of his coming? 
Well, by default, by them asking that question means they know something about the promises of God, right? They've heard something. Maybe they've learned the gospel in one way or another or pieces of it. Or they've heard about the promises. But they know that Jesus said he would return. They know it. It was the hope of Christianity and ought to still be that hope of every real Christian today. The fact that Jesus said, I am coming quickly. Revelation 22, and my reward is with me to give to each according to his works. But scoffers would come in the last days and say, what promise? Where are those promises? You guys have been preaching and teaching and saying this stuff from the very beginning. And what has actually changed? In fact, look what Peter himself goes on to say that they will say. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of... Creation, everything remains the same. Now, I love that he uses the argument that they say everything's been the same since creation. By default, they're admitting there is some sort of a creation. And where do we learn that creation story? Well, Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and then we get the rest of the story, 3 and on. But Genesis 1 and 2 is really the account of the beginning of all things. Especially this earth. And if you read the account of Genesis 1 and 2, and you realize how beautiful everything was, every day you hear God saying it was good, all the way till the sixth day when he says it was very good. And it's described as harmonious, as beautiful, with mankind made in the perfect image of their creator. To reflect that perfect love, that perfect character that comes forth from the one who molded and made them the story is told of a perfect creation so how can you say that everything remains the same does our world look like a world that's harmonious that's peaceful that's filled with love I heard Brother Dan's sermon last week, and he hit it right on the money. We're not in that world anymore. What God created, we are far from it. Sin has ravaged the planet. It has destroyed lives, and it has separated the ones God loves from that great love. And yet the scoffers will come and say, yes, that from the very beginning, from our fathers, <laughs> when they fell asleep from creation, all things remain the same. Just the fact that they would say the fathers fell asleep ought to let you know something's wrong already. Because fall asleep means they died. And Romans chapter 5 teaches us that death came as a result of sin. That's not how what God created. So what are you talking about? Things remain the same. Maybe we've gotten used to the world we're living in. Maybe since it's all we've ever known. We think that's all there ever will be or has ever been. It's easy to grow up that way, right? I mean, I can totally understand it. I've used this illustration in our Bible studies on Thursday nights and Tuesday nights with Goldsboro. I use it here for those of you who have not heard it. You imagine people who are born 
and raised in countries that completely control the information that comes into that country. Completely control it. I'm not going to name any of those countries for online sake. But you can think of some in your own mind. Imagine if you were born in a country like that. Where your education is whatever the state told you it was. The government. That your access to information on the internet was whatever the state gave you access to. That whatever videos or news you heard was whatever the state approved for you to hear. I mean in a hundred percent totality. Because see, some of us in the U.S. think, well, that's, that, we're already there. I'm like, you have no idea. You have no idea how some people have been born and raised. And they're told that reality is what they have lived and seen. And imagine the first time they see a balloon flying in the air and that balloon drops into their yard and they realize it has a radio attached to it. And for the first time, they hear information from outside that country. Information that's not controlled by the state. They might even hear the good news of the gospel. Something they've never received before. Do you imagine what kind of mind-blowing experience that would be? When your reality has been nothing more than this. And your measure of success is based on whatever you've seen others do in that same country. You may not know there's more out there. There's more to attain. There's more to gain. But imagine, what about this world that has been taken over by the kingdom of darkness? And you and I have been born and raised in it. It's what we know. It's what we've been born to know. We know it from birth. Sin and the law of sin, as Paul calls it, is as natural as breathing to us. Are you following me? And if you don't believe it, check yourself in the mirror. Check. For some of us, lying is easy as all get out. Cheating is a simple thing for us. Following our own passions and desires, I can do that easily. But then when we hear the message of the gospel, it's like a veil has been lifted. It's like all of a sudden we've received outside information that this world is not everything. That there is more to the story than what we might have been told. And when you all of a sudden realize that, when you come to that knowledge that the story is greater than just your experience, all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, this is not how the world has always been. It can't be. How is that possible? Some people trying to deny that reality will sit there and say that mankind is naturally good. You really think you're naturally good? How do you define good? What do we define as good? It becomes very relative very fast, right? Without an objective standard of what good is, good is whatever feels good. And truth is, in this planet, whatever feels good today 
may not feel good tomorrow. It's how life works. And so you have scoffers that will rise up in the last days saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as from the beginning of creation. But look what verse 5 says. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Now this is what's interesting. This is what they willfully forget the key adjective the key word descriptor there is willfully right i mean it's tough enough to, to remember right i mean remember the sabbath day remember the lord remember his ways i mean we're forgetful people but to willfully forget something is to intentionally ignore it intentionally put it out of sight out of mind Believe it or not, the Bible says that as we come closer to the end, and imagine, this is Peter writing in the 60s, not 1960s. All y'all hippies, you've heard me say that already. In the actual 60s, and here we are in 2021. And people are willfully intentionally choosing to ignore the reality they live in. I hope you're not one of those people. I don't want to ignore my reality. It's the moment you start ignoring your reality that you will get lost in it. You following me? You will get lost in it. They willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed, verse 6, perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of what? Of ungodly men. You know, he he goes on to say, not only do they forget the creator, not only do they forget what his power has been, they forget that this world has already been judged once before. In fact, we see that story in Genesis. You can pick it up in from verse chapter 3, but really the story of the flood, chapter 5 and on. Five, six, seven, you have the story of the flood. The Bible tells us the world had become so wicked that God's patience ran out. God couldn't bear with the ugliness anymore. The Bible says that every thought and intention that came out of the heart of man was just to do more and more wickedness, more and more evil, more and more pain, more and more hurt, more and more self, more and more trying to gratify, please, self. It was getting so bad that by the time God said enough, there was only one dude on the planet. One who was even trying to walk with God. And I say one because you say God saved eight. Yeah, but if you read the story, he saved the seven because of the one. That's a story for families to pay attention to. Noah walked with God, the Bible says, and he was... (laughs) Perfect in his generation. I always love that. You know, it's almost like God saying, you know, considering what was going on. He was doing all right. (laughs) He was doing okay. He 
was mature in his generation. He was seeking God. He wanted to walk with God humbly and, and seek his grace, his mercy, and his guidance. That's why the Bible makes clear that God loved, favored Noah and his family. And as a result, they were spared the destruction that came by the flood. People willfully forget this. And I always smile because I go, it's funny how we choose to believe some things while ignoring another. Some of you have heard me state that there are scientists today that point out, oh, that they know some great calamity had to have hit this planet. They know it because things like dinosaurs and other animals that existed that we know are gone. We know there was something massive that killed off. A whole bunch of animals, people, and things. But can we say, oh, it's the flood? No. So you know what we come up with? It must have been a meteorite. Based on what? Something you conjured up in your brain? Now, here's what's wild to me. Scientists will come up with this example, try to give whatever kind of proof they have, where the story of a flood and the surviving eight people is told in all parts of the world apart from this book. There are people in China that have that story, Africa that have that story, the Middle East that have that story, Europe that have that story, natives from old that tell a story of a massive flood, a boat, and eight survivors. Do you think something maybe happened? They're not all Christians. They not, they didn't all read the Bible. The story must have come from somewhere. Only illogical thinking brings us to the point where we hear multiple witnesses from different parts of a, a situation come and tell you all the same thing and we turn around and tell them it didn't happen. Would that hold up in a court of law? We look to witnesses, don't we? We look for evidence. In fact... One of my favorite things when I'm talking to young folks or working with apologetics and people are wondering, wrestling with the existence of God and creation, one of the questions that I've asked some young people is simple. How much evidence is enough? How much evidence is enough? You say you want evidence, but how much is enough? And I'm going to give you the example. When a crime takes place, you get a detective that comes out, right? When they come out, did they necessarily witness the crime? Usually not, right? They come out, and what is their job? And how do they find out the facts, Brother Don? Yeah, they ask witnesses, and they look for... Evidence. They look for evidence. Guess what? You might go to the detective. What if we told detectives today, hey man, but you weren't actually there. How many cases would actually be solved today? You weren't there, man. No, we've learned stuff, right? We test DNA. We check out if there was a weapon. Where's the weapon placed in, in, in line up with the victim? And is there somebody else? And, and, and were there other people? Did witnesses see anything? They put all the evidence together. They piece it together. And when you're a jury on the stand in the courtroom, you hear the evidence. And, and, and hopefully there's enough of it to give a clear picture of what happened. Keyword, enough of it. Will you ever have that 100% unless you actually saw it for yourself? How much evidence is enough? In fact, it's interesting to me, I, I, I want to make a visit one of these times to uh, what they call, what do they call it, the Ark Experience or something like that in Kentucky. I, I, I'm, we're, we're planning a trip out there at some point, my family hopefully, and, and uh, you know, our goal is to really experience what happened there in the, uh, the building of this Ark. I mean, they created it almost to uh, as size as much as they can imagine, and they created a museum inside, and, and within it is all these scientific facts, which I laugh because here's what you got to understand y'all not all scientists are atheists 
But I want you to understand something about scientists. The scientists who are atheists tend to like to accuse the scientists who believe in God of not being real scientists. Now that's just an argument that comes from people when they have no other argument. You follow me? They have no other argument. So you just go, you know what? You're just not what you say you are. Yeah, you're not. Oh, you went, you got your PhD. You studied, you're a scientist. You've seen the evidence. You believe in God. No, you can't possibly be a scientist. That's what people say when they've got nothing else to defend themselves with. But here's the problem, y'all. It's not like you go to public school or, or, or universities and everywhere and they're teaching you both sides of the coin. Ask yourself the question, why do they only teach you one side? Do you know when I grew up in a Christian school, we learned about both sides? Evolution and creationism? I learned about both. Do you know that the evolutionist doesn't want you to learn about creationism? Who's holding back what information and why? Why? Why don't they want to give you the opportunity to see for yourself and make up your own mind? There's a reason. Because there's a desire to intentionally forget the creator God. In fact, I want you to see something with me. Hold your finger there in 2 Peter because we're coming back, all right? We're not done yet. Come to Romans chapter 1 real quick. Romans chapter 1. I want you to see what Romans 1 it reiterates in this same understanding. Paul writing... Uh, similar to what some of the things Peter says in Second Peter chapter 3. Look what he says in Romans 1, starting with verse 16. Quickly. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God, the salvation... For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I always love that because, you know, when I say how much evidence is enough, it's also important to realize that at some point faith has to take over. And faith is intelligent. Faith pays attention. Faith notices things. But at some point, faith is important. You have to trust. When you've been given enough information, you have to trust what you've been given. Or you can choose to dismiss it altogether. But notice how he explains that, because he does. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Notice what it says. They intentionally suppress the what? The truth. You don't think that's what's happening in society today? I already gave you the example. The scientists that don't believe in God claim the other ones, they're not real scientists. And those are the consistent. And then what's the control? We're going to teach just one way of viewing the existence of all things. And it starts with the faith premise of its own. Contrary to popular opinion. What is the faith premise? That something... Came out of nothing. That's a faith premise. Prove that to me in the natural world. Show me something in the natural world that has come from nothing. I am yet to see a human give birth to whatever would come after us. We're giving birth to more humans and they're just like us unfortunately. It's what's going on. They suppress the truth for God has shown it to them. He's mad. How has he done it? Look at verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but because... 
but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Here's what's wild to me. Nature. When I look outside, and I've looked up at the stars, I always look up and I go, man, whoever put that stuff up there has got to be big. He's got to be big. It's amazing. And of course, as a good old Adventist, I'm always looking for Orion's belt. That's like the one constellation that I I really know about, you know, because, you know, hey, hey, you know, Jesus is coming and and stuff that Spirit of Prophecy talks about with that and the experience. I'm like, ah, it's so cool, but it's got to be big. And here's what I got to tell you that I love. I remember an experience I had. Some of you may have heard this before, but it fits the context, so I want you to hear it again. I went to Crazy Horse with my wife, the monument there in South. Dakota that they're building off the cliff of, you know, a cliff out there. And it's really cool. And I remember I was outside checking it out and there was this lady out there. She was the Native American of the tribe, the Sioux tribe. And I was just, I started talking with her, asking her about the project, how it was going, what they're doing and, and how they're raising the money to finish the project. I thought, man, it's really, really cool. And then she looked at me and she said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. And she goes, really? She said, you're, I said, of what? I said, well, I'm a Christian pastor. And she said, wow, that's really cool. She says, you know our people. Mm. She said, our people would look at the stars from old. And we knew there was a creator. We called him the great spirit. I said, Whew. you know, we always try to, Christians, our Western form of Christianity tries to think everybody else that wasn't like us are pagans, right? No one ever knew nothing. <laughs> But you know, it's amazing that in John chapter four, when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman, you remember what he told her about God? He said, God is spirit. Not that He's the Holy Spirit. He is spirit as to his nature. You understand? God is spirit. The natives looked up at the stars. They may not have had the name Yahweh or the name Elohim or the name Adonai. They may not have, they didn't speak Hebrew, but they looked and they knew from the evidence in the sky, there is a great spirit out there. And he is worthy of being acknowledged and recognized. And I'm sitting here going, wow. And they're not even using the Bible. That's why Paul says the world is without excuse. It's without excuse. In fact, look what it says. They profess to be wise and then they become fools. Just what I said. They're the only scientists in the world. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds, four-footed animals and creeping things. Romans 1.24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. Now pay attention to all that is in this list, not just the ones you like to pay attention to. Because he gives quite a list here. He gave them up to vile passions, reading, For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, 
not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. That's a pretty long list, isn't it? Whew. I always smile how things like disobeying parents becomes a part of the list of murderers and liars. and how Those kind of things always hit me, you know? Compare it with which, you know why? Because Paul's saying sin is sin. Corruption is corruption. And corruption leads to death in all its forms. And he's giving you a list of all the ways that sin has corrupted humanity. It's corrupted you and it's corrupted me. You can't just pick and choose which parts of that list you want to accept as a corruption just because you may have friends, family, people who might find themselves on that list. If you're honest with yourself, you have found yourself on that list in one way or another. God forbid we would continue in it. So coming back to 2 Peter chapter 3, they ignore the judgment. Verse 7 makes it clear. If they, if they ignore the creation account, the flood account, then they ignore what is coming on this planet. The Bible says, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for what? Fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. They forget it's coming. Now, let's stay in context. They forget it's coming. Their question is, where is the promise? Everything has remained the same. Time has gone on and on and on, and there's nothing that has changed. And then Peter reminds his readers... Of something the scriptures has already stated. In the book of Psalms chapter 90. In verse 8 Peter says. But beloved. Do not forget this one thing. You see they've willfully forgotten things right. They've forgotten their creator. They've forgotten the judge. They've forgotten the judgment. They've forgotten a whole lot. But he says, but you, beloved, you who are believers, don't forget this one thing that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now, I want to be very specific with the Greek here. The Greek word that uses the concept that a day is like a thousand years is the word hos. The word hos is a comparative word. It is not equalizing the day with a thousand. There's another word in Greek for that. It's the word we learned earlier that is the word likewise. Likewise. Likewise means in the same way or equal to something. This is not equating a day with a thousand years. To do that is to take that out of context. What we are seeing is that Peter is quoting from Psalm chapter 90, which addresses the exact same issues. The creation, God's eternality, him being the judge of all things. And in Psalm chapter 90, keep your hand there. In Psalm chapter 90, read that with me for a moment. Open up your Bibles to the book of Psalms. Because when we're doing hermeneutics, y'all, this is why I taught this class. Because we got to pay attention. There is a way to study the Bible. There's a right way and there is a wrong way to do it. When we are paying attention to how to study the Bible, we've got to pay attention to when the apostle is quoting or citing an Old Testament passage, we ought to pay attention to what he's talking about. In Psalm chapter 90, verse 1, which is actually a psalm of Moses, look what it reads. Verse 1, Lord... You have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are what? What's Moses talking about? God is creator and God is what? 
He's eternal, right? He inhabits time, but he is way beyond that. His eternality is great. And then he goes into God as judge. Verse 3, you turn man to destruction. We're talking about judgment, right? You turn man to destruction and say, return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday. Notice the context. It's just like yesterday. When it is past and like a watch in the night. A night watch. Not even addressing the concept we have of a literal just day. All it's saying is that for God, time is not the way we view it. When you inhabit eternity, what is any part of a day? What is a day at all? When you inhabit eternity. That is the clear contextual teaching of this passage. In fact, he tells him, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a night watch. You carry them away like a flood. They are like asleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. You know, what is man in comparison to God? We live 70 years, baby, if we're lucky, 80 years, the Bible says. And if we're real blessed, I was watching something online of a 105-year-old lady who's still running races in Louisiana. That's pretty amazing. I mean, I was, I was very, I, was, I thought that was awesome. It was cool to watch that happen. But if we're lucky, we might make it to that centennial moment, right? Probably takes a lot of work to get there. But hey, you might be able to make it, right? And so I know some of you have that goal by God's goal grace and that'll be something cool uh, but <laughs> but anyway the point is it doesn't matter whether you live 70 80 or 100 years that's relatively short when you're understanding eternity what is 70 years for God so for us when we're looking at a delay when we're looking at everything's remained the same when we're looking at God is being late in fulfilling his promises Peter is simply quoting Psalm 90 to say God does not work out time the way we work it out this is a phrase not to be taken and interpreted any other way the word hos in the Greek is comparative going back to 2 Peter 3 a day to God is like that's why the Bible says like is as something compared to what I feel a day to God. A thousand years is just like that day. It's what Moses said in Psalm 90. It's what Peter who encourages us to pay attention to the prophets would have us pay attention to and listen to. That's why verse 9 of 2 Peter 3 says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness. That's the context. We're dealing with people who think that Christ's coming is somehow delayed in their minds. There it is. That's why the scoffers make fun. Well, he's slack concerning his promises. As some count tardiness, slackness, delay. But it, it's not true. The Bible says he's long-suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. Amen. God is desiring the salvation of all. And for us, we may think it's a delay. But for God, it's not a delay. For God, it's an opportunity. For you and I to make our choice. It's what it is. 
I close our time with these verses for you to pay attention to in 2 Peter 3, verse 10 and on as we close. I will read quickly. Stay with me. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blemish. And consider that the long suffering of the Lord, you see, he's back to that verse. The long suffering of the Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking them of these things, in which are some hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away, With the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. As we close out our time in 2 Peter. The context of this chapter. Is the reality that time has gone on. Because God is being long suffering to his people. To you. And to me. And the call that we have to ask ourselves is. What are we doing with that long suffering that God is showing us? You know Romans chapter 2 says that God's long suffering and goodness is what leads us to. Repentance. And yes, the scoffers might call out a delay in his return, but I'm telling you, Jesus is not delaying. He is coming exactly when he plans to come. But he doesn't have to tell you nor tell me when that is. Because what he makes clear in Matthew 24 is that if we knew when the thief was coming, we'd be ready. But careful, because Jesus will come as a thief in the night. Which ultimately means, when do you need to be ready? When do you need to be ready? Yeah, you don't have tomorrow. You do not have tomorrow to decide to be ready. That is not guaranteed. What is guaranteed, Jesus will return and there will be the end of this world. That's a promise. But you and I have to realize that him coming as a thief in the night is a call for us to live differently, godly lives. In fact, Peter ends his letter the way he begins it in chapter 1, talking about godliness, the power of God to make us like him. And that's why he ends telling his people, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have to be different. We have to be changed. If we're not living like Jesus is coming, like a thief in the night, then what are we living for? He can come at any moment. And of course, I know Adventism. We're so knowledgeable that then we go, yeah, but technically he can't come till X, Y, and Z takes place. Oh, 
You think that's what God gave us those signs for? For us to look at the signs and go, well, we still got 10 miles to go. I'll fix it on the last mile. No. The signs are there, Jesus said, so that when they happen, we might believe. That's what the signs are there for. That when they happen, we might believe that what he promised, he will fulfill. You and I need to be ready for Christ to come like a thief in that night. Are you living differently? Are you living like Jesus is coming today? Can you honestly say that if Jesus came to your door today, you would be ready? What would he find going on in your life? Would he find that he's been working on you from day one? Will he say, well done, good and faithful servant, uh, enter into the kingdom? Or will he say, who are you again? Have we met? I don't know you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness and it doesn't matter if you read the context of those verses everything that God has done right through those people because they can say hey we've cast out demons we've healed the sick we've we've preached we've done all that stuff and Jesus says I don't know you if you're not different, if you're not allowing me to change you, then how do, I don't know you. I, I've never worked in you. I don't just want him to work through me. I want him to work in me. I want him to change me. I want him to change my character, my attitude, my way of responding to life. I want him to change my focus. I want to live for the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. That's what I want to live for. I want to live knowing that, guess what? You can build up whatever mansions on this earth you build up. You can have the best career. You can have it all. But one day it'll all be destroyed. And then what? What will be left when it's all gone? You know, if you read the story of the flood, no one thought to go inside that ark. You know, that door was held open. Held open. The craziest thing is, if you read the story, it's like Noah and his family enter the ark. And for several days, it's, it's there. And all of a sudden, the first drops hit. See, when they entered the ark, the Bible says God closed the door. Can you imagine how everybody else felt? They've been making fun of him for 120 years. Well, because they live really long, right? Four or 500 years old. I mean, Noah himself was like, I forget how old now. How old was he? Some of y'all remember, like 700 years old. I mean, you imagine? I mean, he was just a 20-year-old. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, 700. Well, what is that? When you, you know, at 500, whatever he was. I mean, those were like, you know, teenage years. He goes into the ark with his family. And all of a sudden, everyone's still, man, look at you. It's dry as a bone. And then the first drop hits. The second. The third. The fourth. Now it's pouring. The ground begins to shake. The water starts bursting out of the ground. You didn't even realize was there. 
And now in a mad panic because they realize what they had heard, they run to the ark. The only problem is nobody can get inside. It's been shut by a hand that alone would open it. They can't get in the ark. It's too late. And you know, one of the things that hits me when I read Patriarchs and Prophets is her vivid description of people who hung on to the ark as long as they possibly could until the waters swept them away. The noise of yelling and screaming and animals that died. People who ran to the top of mountains and realized eventually that that still wasn't high enough. It was the end. And they had been given chance after chance, opportunity after opportunity to get it right. They were given hope. The ark was a symbol of hope. And they rejected it. What about you and I today? The ark of hope is Jesus. Jesus living in you and in me. Godly character. Are we truly on board? Are we ready for those raindrops to fall? Only this time it won't be raindrops. The Bible says this time it will be fire. When this is over, it's over. No more sin. No more men destroying this planet. be time to go home I don't know about you but I want to be different enough that I'm ready for that day whatever that means I don't want to be caught in the last moments trying to cling to something that I can't cling to anymore because I've rejected it for too long My prayer in this year, as we come to its close soon, believe it or not, is that we would be a people that truly show the world that we have this hope. A hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts. Faith in the promise of his word. We believe the time is near when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing. Hallelujah. Christ is We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the soon and imminent coming of the Lord. It's your chance again to get on that ark. Stand with me if you would and sing that song with me. We have this hope, our closing hymn. As we end our worship service today, it is the theme of the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's what makes us...